So for our next speaker will be Dr. Jennifer Walthaw, who was appointed as Secretary of the Family and Social Services Administration by Governor Holcomb, effective January 2017. Prior to this appointment, she served as the Deputy State Health Commissioner and Director for Health Outcomes at the Indiana State Department of Health. Dr. Walthall is currently a Professor of Emergency Medicine and Pediatrics at IU School of Medicine. Um, and she's gonna bring that statewide focus, statewide focus to us this morning. really wonderful to be here this morning. Um, I will not uh, even remotely make it through the next 20 minutes without crying. Um, it's really great to see uh, friends and family uh, now in the audience. Um, I will tell you what, three years ago when we met each other, um, I, I didn't know that we'd be standing here today celebrating some of these successes. And so I'll tell you, um, it really is a tribute to the resilience um, of Hoosiers in general and for the love that you can see that we have for each other uh, that's born out of crisis. The goal, though, is that we don't have this crisis again, right? That's the whole, the whole point, is that we design a system that, um, though it works in fire, um, that maybe those fires don't have to occur in the future. And so what I'd like to talk with you about today um, is a little bit of, uh, of our personal experience uh, coming together around uh, the HIV outbreak in Scott County, but then also how we do things differently now uh, because of it that are not located specifically in, in just Austin, but really the way that we look at <clears throat> the entire state and how we come together uh, kind of out of our silos and uh, change the way that we think about who's responsible for what, because it turns out that we're all responsible for everything. And if we can do that and if we can sustain it, it's not just about HIV, it's about health and it's about our connectivity with each other. I'll tell you, when we, um, when we started this, uh, Dr. Adams and I, uh, Dr. Adams was our health commissioner, uh, and I was his deputy, um, the two of us were just uh, barely six weeks on the job. Um, we didn't know we were supposed to fail. Um, and, uh, and Brittany and Patty uh, were incredibly inspirational to us as we uh, came together around uh, something that um, we were um, completely inexperienced, and again, that uh, a little bit of naivete and youthful vigor, uh, being new on the job, I think took us a long way in not realizing what we really were up against. And so uh, this experience truly was a moment of transformation, not just for me personally, um, but for, again, the way that we think about public health and its importance across the state and connecting to um, all of the resources that people need. So this is my favorite picture from uh, the entire then uh, response, and I've set my talk up fairly similarly to Brittany's so that we can kind of compare those things. Um, this was the very first uh, Austin Community Cleanup Day where we taught um, individuals in Austin how to safely pick up uh, needles that had been um, disposed of all over town. Um, as was my, um, my general approach to life whenever I did anything as Deputy Health Commissioner in the evenings or the weekends, I took my, my kids with me. And so Joey and Jack um, had a pretty extraordinary experience in learning about um, the effects of despair on the health of populations and their, their lens and view of life, I think, has been transformed. And I think if we can do that for, for them, we sure can do it for everyone. Um, they got to be, after this day, uh, they got to be really good friends with CDC Dave, which is uh, who we call, uh, we ca that's what we call Dave, who is the communications director for the CDC that helped us um, through uh, our, our campaigns and awareness. Um, they love CDC Dave because he was responsible for designing the zombie preparedness uh, CDC um, campaign a few uh, years ago that broke the internet for a couple of hours and they just thought that was the greatest thing and CDC Dave sent them some zombie apocalypse t-shirts that, uh, <laughs> that they still wear um, periodically. So um, the cool thing about this day was um, as we were driving home and I asked them Hey guys, what did you what did you think about today? Um, they you know they picked up a few needles. Um, they actually picked up trash and talked to some folks um, as we walked around together in the community. And what they said was um, that was really um, there was a, a lot of really sad stuff that we saw today. And I said, yeah, it really was. And he said, um, they said, um, it looks just like where Grandma and Grandpa live. I said, yeah, it sure it does. It looks exactly like where Grandma and Grandpa live, small town in Indiana. 
And, he's, and they said, well, we hope that we maybe helped today that it actually is more like where grandma and grandpa live. I mean, I think that community engagement, that uh, there is hope uh, in recovery is, is really cool. So the awareness campaign that came uh, along with this, this is again the then, is uh, that we had to build from scratch um, an awareness campaign because it, there's nothing like this that had happened elsewhere to be uh, developed to sort of kind of in the moment educate folks or re-educate uh, around what HIV was, um, how it was transmitted, um, how hope and recovery was possible. And this uh, campaign has been um, picked up and used in multiple other places um, across the country. Now, unfortunately, um, this, uh, this HIV outbreak was born uh, by many other chronic diseases that we now are dealing with. Uh, substance use disorder being uh, very common, um, and the out, um, outbreak was a, a response to that. So uh, hepatitis C was the harbinger. We started to see a ton of hepatitis C clusters in about 2012. But if you look all the way back to 2008, you'll see that that trajectory of um, drug poisoning deaths started to go up. And in fact, in 2008, our drug overdose deaths in Indiana uh, eclipsed our motor vehicle collision deaths. So over a decade ago, we had the glimmer that this, this was coming. We've not yet seen the crest of this wave, and I say that um, all the time to remind us that though we're talking about successes today, uh, that we're not done. Um, in fact, we just received our 2016 aggregate data from the federal government, and you can see that included on this slide, that from 2015 to 2016, our trajectory for overdose, opiate overdose deaths continues to rise. Now, we all lived through 2016, so this is not a shocking number to any of us. However, we really are looking to see that uh, starting to plateau. And in fact, really exciting, uh, last week we get a, uh, I get our aggregate um, drug information in a dashboard every Monday in my email inbox. And 10 counties in Indiana last week, for the first time in 10 years, saw a plateau. So we're starting to see glimmers of hope in our real-time data, which is very exciting. This is the saddest of all the slides for me when I look at what opiate um, addiction, substance use disorder looks like and for what populations. You can't see on the bottom of the slide, but that big, tall blue bar uh, represents 30 to 39-year-olds. And these are individuals who, when I was 30 to 39, I was thinking about, you know, I'd finished residency and I was thinking about buying my first house and having another kid and what my next job would be. And that's what everybody should have the opportunity to do. To do. Um, and yet, we have a huge uh, group of, of Hoosiers in this age that should be incredibly positive and full of hope that are thinking about something very, very different. Again, um, our drug deaths involving heroin in particular, you don't have to be a statistician to know that when the line is going nearly completely vertical, that's bad. And so that's where we are now, and we have, again, so much more work to do. Um, Brittany showed this slide as well. It is uh, one of my favorites too because how this outbreak was handled was nothing short of inspired um, because co-locating services so that individuals could come in at the beginning of the day with no hope and leave with um, their lives changed. Um, one, they might have a new diagnosis of HIV, but with that comes health insurance, a birth certificate, a driver's license, immunizations, a referral for mental health services, a doctor, um, a job training, maybe going uh, back and getting an, an education. Uh, Dr. And Ad Dr. Adams and I uh, were profoundly affected by a young, young man, 26, who came up to us and told us that HIV saved his life. Now, that's a pretty, pretty profound statement, but at the time it was true, um, because what he thought before that diagnosis was that he would die. He would die of an overdose or he would die of an infection. And what, what he learned through this process was that that didn't have to happen. Now what we decided to do at that point was make sure that no one had to get HIV to save their life. And so that's what the transformative moment of that statement of we can't wait. We can't wait for HIV outbreaks to occur to build a system just like this that helps people before that happens um, to have their lives saved. And so let me talk a little bit about now. Uh, we could talk for the next three weeks about what's happened in the last three years, but this is just a small smattering of the work that's not only happening um, in Scott County, but happening across our state. 
Um, we were uh, cited as instrumental in how syringe service program funding changed, so the federal ban on using state dollars uh, to fund syringe service programs. Uh, was overturned in 2016. Uh, decades of work done by individuals across the country and this moment in time helped really solidify that funding change so that we could have um, not only uh, legal syringe service uh, programs and their connections to recovery, but also the funding to keep them up and running. We also have multiple sites that do universal screening in high-risk spaces, so both HIV and hepatitis C screening in emergency departments. Um, in local jails um, and in corrections. And those are the places where we catch outbreaks before they happen and know that we need to intervene earlier rather than later. And so universal screening was, uh, uh, before the outbreak, was relegated to one very large urban emergency department in Indiana. And now happens in, uh, in the Scott Memorial Hospital. Um, happens in Fayette County and happens in multiple other rural spaces uh, with a team of folks uh, from ISDH that go and help those um, emergency departments and jails uh, connect those individuals immediately to the services that they need. And also the individuals that are high risk but negative um, that can get uh, connected to um, PrEP, which is um, a great way to prevent HIV if you have uh, risk factors, and then also to treatment services for substance use disorder as well. There is, we helped to uh, build a CDC toolkit. Uh, Indiana is prominently featured in that, which is, has been live for just a week, hot off the presses, on all of the things that you need to do to prevent um, an HIV hepatitis C outbreak um, in an area where there is a large pr uh, preponderance of opiate overdose deaths and persons who inject drugs. This toolkit is remarkably well done, and if you um, haven't seen it, I'll show you the link in just a moment, and you, you really should check it out. The, uh, the Indiana story, um, our goal for telling the Indiana story is so that no one else would have to live the Indiana story and that Indiana would never have to relive the Indiana story, and this is a great um, product that's the output of that. We also um, helped the CDC develop a vulnerability index so that every year the entire country has surveillance based on data to see where the high risk areas are and counties are across the country so that they can implement um, emergency services uh, for these events. We have the 21st Century Cures uh, Act, uh, the uh, Scott County team to thank for that uh, funding across the country. Uh, $10.9 million came to Indiana last year and has been very well spent for services and expansion of treatment. We um, just received our uh, second year, $10.9 million, and that um, announcement of how that will be spent for 2018 will come on Thursday this week at our Drug Commission. We expect to receive almost uh, potentially double or triple that for year three based on uh, a change in the calculations that are not just population-based but disease burden-based, and so Indiana uh, will be able to take those programs even further. We used that 21st Century Cures uh, dollars at FSSA to expand treatment and novel programs, one of which uh, Brittany uh, alluded to, which is peer recovery coaches in emergency departments. We started with those in the counties where syringe service uh, programs are so that we can connect those individuals who need uh, recovery support in those counties. And we are excited in year two to really expand those uh, peer recovery services where they're located. But even more um, importantly, we used the 21st Century Cures dollars to start programs that then could be sustained through the renewal of the Healthy Indiana Plan. Within the Healthy Indiana Plan, the new 1115 waiver, we expanded um, substance use disorder services and coverage for the entirety of Medicaid, so 1.4 million Hoosiers having probably the best SUD coverage in the country uh, through that renewal package. And so really excited to, again, blend these uh, funding opportunities into sustainability so that what we see successfully in our um, programming for 21st century cures, we can sustain for, um, for the future. Again, we alluded to our data dashboard that was um, built. It is all agencies that touch substance use disorder. Um, we see those um, blended and overlay um, data on every Monday. 
And so we can respond in real time. One of the other programs that we started with the 21st Century Cures dollars is a, um, is a recovery uh, response team. So as we see hotspots of emergency department visits or hepatitis C cases or seizure of uh, fentanyl from the state police, we can go to those communities, do surveillance of what the resources are that are available, and then fill in the gaps and build sustainable uh, recovery processes. Um, our health commissioner is the Surgeon General now, if no one noticed, um, and, uh, and he, has, he has taken this uh, story of recovery to the national level and is using that platform really to um, advance the incredible work that's been done here so that others don't have to recreate it. They can take our template for success and implement it in their space. And so what, a, what an incredible um, opportunity for us to have such an advocate um, in that spot. And boy, um, I don't think... I don't think C DC has seen the likes of Jerome before, so we're really happy to have him there. We also have our own pillar. Uh, Governor Holcomb is uh, a pretty cool guy to work for. I'm not sure I'm allowed to say that up here, but he's a pretty cool guy to work for. And, um, and his, one of his five pillars is to combat the opiate epidemic. You can't ask for a whole lot more support than that for really digging in and looking for long-term sustainable recovery processes. So taking care of the emergency before us, expanding treatment access and availability, and then really focusing in on prevention in that two-gen approach so that two generations from now, we're not talking about this anymore. Hopefully, we're not talking about anything bad anymore. We're, we've really built a system that helps sustain us for health for the future. Uh, Indiana Medicaid now, as of September 1st, covers all three medicines for medication-assisted treatment. That is a big policy change, and we've seen some extraordinary success just in the six months that that went live. So methadone, naltrexone and buprenorphine all covered by Indiana Medicaid and meth methadone in particular was a really uh, novel way to think about Medicaid coverage for a medicine. Instead of paying for just the medicine, we actually bundle it as a service with treatment. And so individuals get that evidence-based therapy all wrapped together uh, with, a, with a bundled rate. So very excited about that program. It's helping individuals um, have access to opiate treatment programs uh, under um, the Medicaid umbrella. We've expanded our OTPs, speaking of opiate treatment programs, by five this year and ha have permission to expand by nine next year. Our five new ones were based on data, and they were based on the geography of where opiate over death overdose deaths were occurring and how far the drive was to the nearest OTP. The next nine will be uh, targeted so that we reach our stated goal of having every Hoosier within an hour's drive of an OTP. And so when we have these next nine up and running uh, by 2019, uh, we should have achieved that goal. We also have the best, I think, naloxone policy climate in the country. We have a statewide standing order signed first by Dr. Adams um, in a very short week-long period of time between Dr. Adams and Dr. Box. I got to put my name on it. I was really excited about that. Um, and now uh, signed by Dr. Box so that essentially naloxone is over the counter um, anywhere that you would like to get it. Um, available for laypersons to deliver and for bystanders um, and for first responders as well. Again, the Healthy Indiana Plan renewal is an essential tool to maintain recovery and access to services. Just by flipping the switch on that 1115 waiver, we expanded access to inpatient and residential services by nearly 30%. And that's just in, that has been live since March 1st. New stuff and going, going really well. Um, we have new uh, acute prescriber rules that were live uh, July 1st of last year, and we've seen just in Indiana Medicaid um, over 25% reduction in opiate prescribing. Um, and across the state, our numbers are looking um, almost as good. So really exciting stuff coming out of those new prescriber rules. Um, we are helping to fund the integration of INSPECT, which is our prescri prescriber drug monitoring program within all EMRs. That's in a two-year rollout process. We're in uh, almost 40% of hospitals, and then are funding additionally getting, in, in a parallel process, getting uh, INSPECT embedded in the EMR in some of our rural clinics. So we're doing the big hospitals with um, the professional licensing agency and some of the rural clinics through 21st Century Cures dollars. We have incredible partnerships. None of this would be possible if we didn't have the right people at the table. And so um, instead of, I think, what we were doing before, which was a public health versus public safety um, fight around what substance use disorder and HIV and hepatitis C strategies should be, now it's and. And uh, to that end, we had a public health and public safety fighting the opiate epidemic conference last August that we had to um, change the venue three times because it kept selling out. Uh, this is an incredible synergy across sectors to make a difference, 
to, to sit together at the table, learn each other's languages, and figure out how we can do things collectively, not in an or, but in an and mentality, and, and really get to yes. So this is the success slide. Um, and thanks to our uh, HIV team who is here with us from ISDH for sending this along. I poke at them every once in a while to say, hey, how's it going? And, uh, and get these slides. And this is our um, continuum of HIV care in Austin as of uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, so you see that we've got 222 uh, engaged in care, 120 in care coordination. And uh, the viral suppression rate, if you can't see it, is, uh, is above 75% in the community. This is, this is incredible. When you think about what the CDC wants for the country, the 90-90-90 rule, um, there's no reason in the world why Scott County should be um, hitting those markers, and yet they are. Um, in fact, if you look at HIV, uh, the HIV continuum of care in Austin as compared to the rest of the state, they're actually knocking it out of the park. So really, um, the, a great example of how working together and coming together as a community um, can be uh, public health in action. They also are doing really good stuff um, together that doesn't have anything to do with the state. <laughs> it has everything to do with, with them, with the community uh, coming together around crisis and not letting them not letting it win. And so the community, uh, the County Achievement Award for Scott County for the Syringe Exchange and Outreach Program is uh, what an incredible testimony to um, the despair of just, just three years ago um, and the beacon of hope that that has uh, become in such a short period of time. One of my favorite programs that is live as of uh, March 15th is the Open Beds program. We funded this out of our 21st Century Cures dollars as well. One of the things we, we learned in Scott County is that when people are ready to go into treatment, you need to have something for them right then. And saying come back in a week is just not acceptable, and the chances of successful recovery are made better if you have something in the moment, in that teachable moment when you wake up, and as I joke occasionally, you wake up in the ER after getting naloxone and the lights above you, you're not sure if it's heaven or the ER, and you think, oh, good, it's ER. I'm, I, think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna do something different today. And so the Open Beds is the, is the first program in the country that is, it's like, a, it's like a dating service for substance use disorder. So you're ready for treatment, and this allows us to have a holistic view for the entire state of where those inpatient or residential treatment beds are available. Now that's pretty cool by itself, but the even more brilliant component is that it's embedded <clears throat> within our Indiana 211 network so that when those individuals leave inpatient or residential treatment, they have the case management and wraparound service for the over 7,000 not-for-profit services that these folks need to maintain recovery. Housing, education, food security, energy assistance, job training, whatever it might be that we have all of those in a continuum to really maintain recovery. I'm really excited to announce that in just a month of this being live, we've had over 100 successful referrals and placements. Unbelievable, unbelievable. <clears throat> we also are live with the Indiana ECHO MAT program. This is, again, one of our really amazing programs that uh, has startup funding through the 21st Century Cures dollars. Over 120 rural providers are learning how to do medication-assisted treatment. Talk about being able to use the assets that you already have and build them out. This is, this is pure brilliance. And so um, the docs that are enrolled in this program um, are already doing incredible work for our vulnerable populations in rural communities. We also are live with our anti-stigma or humanizing campaign, which is Know the Oat Facts. And this is born out of what we learned um, from Austin. And it's really important that we know there are three things that we need to know for recovery. One is that substance use disorder is a disease. Two is that there is treatment. And three is that recovery is possible. And if you can take those three things home and change the way that we interact with each other, uh, we really are going to go places. <clears throat> so why? Why did we have a transformative moment in public health? Why was Scott County um, the thing that we needed to get up and walk together? And, uh, and, and it's really that Hoosiers uh, inherently are great people. And we really do love each other. But every once in a while, we just get kind of stuck. And so the main reason that I'm here today is that this is a story that we can't forget. Um, it's three years later, and we're already starting to see 
some of that energy around what we, what we built together th uh, three years ago start to dwindle and we can't. Um, now is actually the time to work even harder because as we start to see success, we gotta keep going and we've gotta keep that momentum and that urgency to get the job done. And so attention to public health meets everyone's objectives. Um, it's, it's all the right stuff. It's fiscally responsible, it's compassionate, it's data driven, it connects resources ac across sectors and it drives improvements beyond health, like Brittany said. We see economic return. We see um, people going to school and going to work and rebuilding their lives because public health interventions are everybody's, uh, in everybody's best interest. And so um, I'd just like to leave you with, uh, with one final thought, which is that if we could, just for a moment, imagine uh, getting out of our safe spots, and doing things that we never thought possible before, uh, where, where could we be? That's not a dream, that's the reality. That's exactly what uh, the folks in Scott County did. They looked at a problem, they said, here are the things that we can't do, we're gonna do them anyway. Thank you so much.